we are speaking with two prominent chief information officers to talk about strategy in 2021. Cynthia Stoddard is the chief information officer at Adobe. My responsibilities um, include you know, all the IT infrastructure, our applications, our data infrastructure. Um, also a group that we call the employee experience, which I think is quite important as we head into 2021. And I also have responsibility for what we call the run component of some of our products. We call that group reliability engineering. So it runs things like Creative Cloud, Document Cloud, and our infra product infrastructure. And then I wonderfully, you know, participate in incorporating and bringing our, you know, acquisitions on board. So never a dull moment, and I enjoy everything that I do. Our second guest is an old hand at CXO Talk, uh, Jay Farrow. He is the Chief Information Officer at ERT. Jay, tell us about your role at ERT. We are in e-clinical solutions in the pharma industry, and we provide patient safety and efficacy, eff efficacy endpoint data collection solutions uh, for use in the clinical uh, drug development space. Now, a quick thank you to Productive, a SaaS management platform that unlocks the power hidden in your SaaS applications to bring you higher ROI, better team collaboration, and lower license costs. What are the kinds of significant issues that you're looking at when you think about the CIO role and the challenges and opportunities that you you face during this year? We're still in COVID. You know, we've uh, been in this world for what nine nine months now. And when I look at the challenges going into 2021, I would wrap them all around the word experience and experience from the point of view of our employees and the experience from the point of view of our customers. Um, on the employee side, you know, we have um, this employee experience group I mentioned in the intro, intro, and we've wrapped a number of personas around our workers. And what we're trying to do is really help them be more productive in the world that we are in right now. You know, um, not only with their work tools, but also with, you know, balancing the life. Because there is, there is no boundary anymore between work and home. Uh, it's kind of all meshed together. So, you know, we've been looking at different applications and things to really help the employee out. Um, and happy employees make happy customers. On the customer side, it's all about the customer experience, making sure that you know when they access our websites or any of our products, they're reliable, they're peppy, you know, they do everything that the customer needs them to do. And you know, helping our you know internal uh, workers, you know, the back office and engineers, you know, make that happen. So you know, when I look at my world in 2021, it's all about experience and working with employees and working with customers. What does that mean for the CIO role? When we talk about experience, where's the, where's the impact for you? I think the impact um, is, you know, with empathy and putting yourself in the shoes of your customers. I'll just give you an example. So when we look at a lot of our back office systems, and I think this generally is true for, you know, a lot of companies, they've been optimized for each department they haven't actually been optimized for end-to-end -end flows. So if you take an outside in view, if you um, use techniques such as design thinking and look across the organization, uh, you're gonna have a, you're gonna look at things much differently because you're gonna look at how the user is impacted by the flow, the ultimate customer, not the person actually doing the transactional work. So I think it's important where, you know, it intersects with the CIO role is we have a very um, horizontal view of companies and of the world, and we can bring people together and we can bring people together to understand that, you know, business process A, you know, if we optimize here, it may impact business process B, but overall it's better for the customer and it's better for the company. As you think about the, the challenges that are associated with this, what, what are they? You know, everybody is remote. It's really important to, you know, stay connected to individuals, you know, pulse them, understand um, what is going on. 
so that as you look at these into inflows, you can take in that um, the temperature of your different constituents into the into the process. So staying connected and you know really <laughs> making the virtual rounds with uh, you know with everybody, I think is really really key. And then understanding how newer technologies can be injected in to these processes to get that better experience for everybody. We have a question from Simone Jo Moore, and she asks, with five generations in the workplace now, I think there can be an assumption that people know something we think is just every day, but maybe not for them. So I think this speaks, Jay, to the the, the challenges of this broadly distributed workforce. It's not just broadly distributed geographically, but now in everybody's house. And so, so Jay, talk to us about that for a moment. You have to be very intentional about considering the whole, you know, your whole team, the whole person, right? Because they're at home, they have children, they have families, um, everything is blended together. Everything is a, is a mishmash. So you have to be really intentional about checking on their health, their what's going on, if they're working too much, are they engaged? What's So I, I feel like you. it's a little bit easier when you're at work because it, you're in a dedicated workspace in an office. So you, you got to be, you know, you got to be real intentional with making sure you're taking care of the entire employee. And what does that really mean? That means, you know, drop-ins, looking for virtual uh, happy hours. I know my friend Jason James does a lot of virtual water cooler type stuff, a lot of drop-ins and, and just making sure you're staying engaged and letting people know that you're there and you're, you always have a virtual open door uh, is key. And obviously the other challenge I think is just besides connectivity today, uh, is security and making sure you're staying on top of all the new challenges that are out there from a security perspective. Cynthia, when it comes to this kind of internal versus external set of perspectives, when you think about customer experience, even when you think about employee experience, you are taking this empathetic outside in view as you were describing before. That's quite different from the historical role of the CIO, which was really looking inward toward systems and technologies. Would you agree with that? I would 100% agree with that. Um, and it is maybe uncomfortable for some CIOs and some people to do that. But I think it's really critical in today's world to actually take that view. Because I actually don't know how you can be successful unless you put the customer first. And, you know, I've stood up in front of our, you know, engineering organization and talked about, you know, how would you feel if, you know, you were trying to do something on somebody's website and it didn't work? Would you come back again? And I think putting yourself in the perspective of that customer really goes a long way in making you think differently. And then bringing those experiences back to your team. I mean, Jay talked about um, staying connected with the team, you know, socially and everything else. And that's very, very important. But while you're doing that, you can also, you know, inject, you know, different aspects of the business and how people interact and, you know, kind of use those as check-ins, but also as education sessions to, you know, look at that into, and bring that same perspective into the groups. Uh, we also do something where we reward different behaviors with what we call an IT identity award. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, how do we change our, you know, persona? How do we change our DNA? How do we make it different and more customer focused? And then quarterly, we look at different behaviors and say, hey, self, not, not self, but, you know, peer nomination and business even nominates our folks to say, hey, they've demonstrated these behaviors. And it's really nice to give out those awards. Jay, thoughts on that one? I think we have to eat our own cooking and engage as a customer. When I was at ACS and, and even at AIG and other companies, whether it was forming our own relay team, uh, creating our own fundraisers, using the tools that we provide millions of volunteers or millions of customers, you've got to be able to put yourself in the seat of the customer. And quite frankly, uh, make that infuse, don't make it a one-time thing, infuse it into your culture that you're it is it is expected that uh, that you're gonna you know live a day in the life all the time. I used to do ride bys with our, our customer service folks, get out into the field, but also engage with your actual customers. So I want my IT folks 
engaging as customers, but then I actually want to talk to our non-IT, you know, our real customers and, and just really understand where their pain points are. And, and I think it's so important to understand that because most of the great ideas that we had, innovative ideas that came out of IT, came from folks who truly understood customer experience, right? They didn't think about themselves as just a DBA or just a .NET developer or just a DevOps engineer. They thought of themselves as, a, as an IT person that represented an organization. And they truly, Michael, had an understanding of how the organization delivered its products or services and where they fit into that value chain. And when you understand that, I, I think you take you know a little more ownership and the ideas just start to, to, to come. And I, and I think Cindy's right. And you got to reward and recognize we had something very similar called the IT code. And we awarded a, a, an IT code champion award to our folks who best embodied those qualities and people loved it. That's a great point. You know, years ago, um, when I was in logistics, we had a ride with the driver program where we would set people mm -hmm. out and actually ride with our pickup and delivery drivers. And one time people came back and said, hey, you know what? What we're designing is not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. They can't use it. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, programs where you can immerse yourself into that customer experience, not just as a sideline watcher, but actually as a doer, it just goes such a long way. Arsalan Khan on Twitter and JJ James on LinkedIn are both commenting on the importance of the CIO in cultivating that uh, corporate culture that acknowledges the experience and placing the customer at the center. What about that aspect, the need to be equal parts technologist and equal parts cultural leader? People look at leadership, right? Whatever role you're in. But again, the CIO, we touch everything. I can't think of any part of the company that we don't touch. So how we, you know, the culture and the ideas we bring to the table, um, you know, they just go out all, all over the place. And, uh, you know, in my particular role, I, you know, I work with engineering, I work with business people, it could be an accountant, it could be marketing, it could be a lot of different areas. And, you know, how we talk about each other and how we look at bringing ideas together and how we look at operating as one unit and putting titles and departments to the side is really critical. And we can demonstrate that because we're not a silo. We're a horizontal organization. I agree. I think City has done such a magnificent job of representing Adobe and in, in the other roles that she's had uh, since we've known each other. And, and I think I've tried to do the same, whether it was at ACS or at AIG or Earthlink or whatever, where I want my organization to feel really invested in what we're doing and feel that they, ha they have an equal uh, stake in, in, in delighting our customers to attract and retain our customers. And I want them to be excited to be part of the organization that they're, they're excited about and understand that they're making a difference in people's lives, no matter what we're doing. Right? We're delivering a high quality product or service. We're, you know, fighting cancer, whatever it is. I want our folks, our IT folks, to get real excited about that. And it, it, the excitement starts when they understand how they fit in to the bigger picture. The other thing I think it does as, a, as an IT organization is it generates credibility with the rest of the business that IT is all in and invested in the well-being of the organization and the growth and the success of the organization. We are, to Cindy's point, we are not a black box. We're not a silo. I mean, I've been in some IT shops where they are so disconnected from what the organization does. You, you, you wouldn't know whether or not they're a manufacturing company or, or a pharma company. I, I want our IT organization to generally get excited about what they do. Because I think it just radiates and, and I think it just generates this, hey, we want to do business with IT internally because they understand what we're doing and they understand what we're trying to do as an organization. You know, if you think about what we do in IT, we do a whole variety of different projects. We do, you know, these really large projects that are quite visible. And then we do a lot of small stuff. And when you were talking, Jay, what it made me think of is all the small stuff and how I, you know, talk to my team about that 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 is so special. There are so many nuggets there that actually can be extracted and they have huge business impact, but they're not generally seen. 
um, because they're just, you know, things that people do day in and day out to, you know, help the business users or help customers out. And I think part of the CIO role, and Jay, I know you've done this, is actually to be that advocate and bring those to life in front of our you know, business people and others in the organization so that people can understand how they connect, but other people can also understand the contributions that IT is making. We have a question from Twitter and the at CXO talk uh, social account, which is Elizabeth Shaw, is asking about the distinction between employee experience and customer experience. Do you handle those, think about those differently? Are they the same for you? Any thoughts on that? We do a lot with experience in general, you know, I, and uh, when I joined, um, I said, hey, you know, our customers have this great experience. Why don't we take that same great, the principles of that same great experience and bring them internally? And that's why we formed this employee experience organization. I think the principles are the same. I mean, you look at, you know, different customers with different personas and different ways of, you know, interfacing and customers have a journey. Um, same with employees. I mean, if you look, take the same principles and apply customer journey to employee journey, you know, you can look, you know, uh, and, you know, gear tools to a new employee versus a more seasoned employee versus a different persona. So I think how you react and the solutions that you provide may be slightly different because you need different tools internally versus externally. But I think the underlying principles of looking at a journey and looking at experience are pretty much the same. Cities nailed it. I mean, the principles are exactly the same. I mean, you're all about removing friction and 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 improving the. To, to Cindy's point earlier, uh, you know, happy employees or happy team. Uh, generally, you're going to have happy. Generally, you're going to have happy customers. So the principles are exactly the same. It's all about uh, retaining and, and delighting and removing roadblocks to let folks really shine and 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 get real happy with what you're producing. So I feel like the principles are the same. The mechanics are different. You know, uh, the systems are different, but um, I think the same principles apply. Chris Peterson asks about security in this work from home era where now you're not just defending a limited number of offices, but you have every employee is an endpoint. What about that? Well, it's added a degree of difficulty, right? Because you're, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot less standardization if you're allowing folks to use devices that they haven't procured. But look, if, if your goal is to just throw up a perimeter around your organization, it's not 2000 anymore, or it's not 1998 anymore. It, it's, you know, it's different. I mean, there's an educational component that I think is a priority when you're working from home to make sure your, your staff and your team understand the risks. And I think that has to be amplified. Uh, I think there are obviously a myriad of tools that, you know, whether it's VPN, MDM, all of those things, but it always starts with education. But to Chris's point, and I think it's a very good one, it does add a degree of difficulty when suddenly now there's no critical mass of people in, an, in a number of offices where you can kind of throw up barbed wire. Uh, I don't know that there ever, you know, there hasn't been that in a long time anyway, but I'd love Cindy's thoughts. I agree. I mean, we've, um, yeah, we've clicked over, you know, 25,000 people over a weekend, but we had been, we had a number of people who were all uh, either um, working remote or were traveling and working remote, you know, assigned to an office and traveling remote. And I agree with Jay, you know, you, uh, you know, if you just have security around your offices or your campuses, then that's very, you know, 2000 ish. Um, you have to really look at, you know, endpoints and managing that and managing security in a different way. You know, we had invested in um, zero trust network technology. So that made, you know, a lot of our transition and actually the experience for our employees a lot better. So I think security is absolutely paramount. And I think looking at how you provide it and how you extend it. I mean, I tell my team, you know, we're always going to be hybrid, right? So um, you know, um, make believe that, you know, our offices are, I mean, they're still there, but it's going to be a different world. So we need to look at network connectivity. We need to actually even look at how we 
you know, pr- provision networks and security in a much different way. How do you think about the investments that your organizations are making? Do you look at it through the lens of technology, through business needs? How does this, how does this all work? I've always looked at investments as a balanced portfolio, right? So, um, you know, through many different lenses or not many, but a, a few different lenses because we have different hats and we need to support different capabilities. So, you know, the systems need to run, infrastructure needs to be there, all of that needs to take place. So that's kind of table stakes. So you have to kind of invest in that, run the business. But then I think there is a balance in looking at strategic and looking at, you know, supporting day-to-day business needs. And then some of this becomes actually a negotiation, right? Because maybe some of these day-to-day business needs are, are perceived to be needed like this year. But in reality, something that is more strategic will help us in you know, a little longer than that. So you kind of have to negotiate with your business users on how much strategic and how much you support the day-to-day. But I look at it as a pie, and I look at it to make sure that you know, we have all the different, you know, the different components supported uh, the way that we should to match our business goals and objectives. And then kind of look at if the different, you know, uh, users in the different departments and make sure that, you know, we're servicing them in the right way. I agree. I, I think it's always a balanced portfolio approach. I mean, ideally, the, the more that you can invest in, in solutions and products and services for your customers, and the more you can invest in innovation, the, the better. And what it does is there's always going to be that component of kit low or keep the lights on or run and maintain. But I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in being very consistent about driving that down and constantly thinking about how we can get better at ma- and letting the trains run on time and in getting rid of technical debt. Because quite frankly, when you stop looking at it is, is when it always starts to grow and stink. So the minute you take your eye off it, to Cindy's point, it's time to have some tough conversations about sunsetting legacy systems, um, you know, getting rid of some of those dependencies, duplicative systems. Do we truly need it? And taking a hard and fast look, because those are dollars I want back. Not to mention they're usually security risks, their time sucks, their labor sucks. I mean, you just, it, there's nothing good about it. So the, the, the more you can simplify and make that just a part of your, your DNA to constantly keep a lens on how you, you know, you simplify your, your tech debt and legacy portfolio, the better, because I want to put as much as I can in that growth engine over time, right? I want innovation and growth. I want to retain the customers I have, but I want to continue to delight them through innovation and new product offerings and, and et cetera. But we also want to grow the organization and you're not going to do that with 17 duplicates of a legacy system uh, wrapped around your neck. Cindy, how do you think about this issue of technical debt and and the related issue of ensuring that as much investment as possible is spent on innovation as opposed to maintaining systems? I think Jay covered that, and I totally agree with him. You need to make it part of your process. So in my world, um, you know, when we do a project or an initiative or whatever you want to call it, Uh, that is going to replace, you know, or or could replace a particular system, it's part of the plan to retire. I mean, it's not something that we will say, hey, we're going to do later. It's the last, retirement is the last step. And I think that making it culturally part of, um, you know, what you do helps, helps build that mindset that, yes, we need to retire our technical debt. We need to think about it as part of the life cycle. Because, uh, yeah, technology has a life cycle, and part of it is to get rid of it when you don't use it anymore. So that's how we handle that. On the innovation part, um, innovation is an interesting topic. You know, one thing about uh, Adobe is, you know, we feel that innovation can come from any place in the company. So we don't have, when we have a great, super research team, but we don't have innovation teams that are kind of sprinkled around. What I try to encourage people to do is look at problems and solve problems. So, um, you know, if we, and I like to challenge people by giving them a problem and saying, hey, how would you particularly look at this and solve it? And giving them the time to experiment and then giving them the time to fail, right? And because you learn through failure. 
So, um, you know, just putting out these problems for people, Michael, is the way that I handle innovation. And, you know, naturally now they come up with their own ideas and bring it forward. Cynthia, then it sounds like you're looking at it through the dual lens of the technology life cycle, knowing the technology has a limited life cycle and we have to plan for that. And at the same time, we have to be thinking about innovation and addressing the business needs. And so it sounds like you're weaving these two threads together. Absolutely. That is absolutely correct. And, you know, I think if you empower people and allow them to, you know, look at different technologies, be they open source or whatever, and experiment, I mean, we have had amazing ideas that have been brought forward. Um, You know, one of those was what we call our self-healing framework, you know, healing as a service that looks at, you know, operational processes, you know, and uh, if something is going to fail and run out of space or something like that, it self heals. So, and that came just from innovation of a group, you know, and a problem that we had posed for them to solve. Jay, it sounds to me like that's easier said than done. So what are the challenges that a CIO will face when trying to balance these sometimes conflicting or competing goals? Well, it starts with relationships and communication and making sure that you're all on the same page with what the goals of the organization are and being the other, the other thing it starts with, Michael, is starts with facts. I'm not a big, I'm not a big giant fan of you know getting into emotional discussions because look, I mean, sunsetting legacy systems, um, where we spend our dollars can sometimes be a, a very contentious discussion. Product owners think theirs is the is the the shiniest object or the one you know the one that needs the most investment. So, you know, having fact based discussions. Uh, is always always a key to that, and I think something Sydney said about you know thinking about the retirement of of tech debt as you're building a system. I think it's a very interesting way to to look at it, and I agree. I think it's fascinating. I, I think you know making sure that when you develop a system, you're you're developing it simply. You're develop you're you know you're you're not just chasing a shiny object. You're reusing as many components as you've built and and you're really thinking about that holistic customer experience and you're not intentionally building another stovepipe uh, that's just going to get really ugly uh, or with a lot of tentacles and with manual processes. The last thing I'll say about that is I think there's a huge opportunity, you know, Cindy touched on it with self-healing networks for automation and really pushing down some of those repetitive tasks that employees and staff don't want to deal with, with, you know, uh, technologies like RPA and other automation technologies to, to, to really get those um, off their plate so that you can focus on higher value, you know, higher value uh, activity. We talk about that as our virtual workforce that complements our human workforce. And um, that's one area where you know, we've looked at, you know, building a platform and then even allowing business users to automate some of the activities with the toolkit on top of that. So great point. Um, RPA. I'm just trying to make that pie bigger, right? You got to make yeah. the pie. Look, I want exactly. the pie as big as I can. Michael mentioned the pie. Yeah. I, I want that pie as big as I can. And the way that you get it bigger, obviously, is to execute and you have your team be world class, but get rid of that technical debt, simplify your architecture and your infrastructure continual improvement, automate wherever possible, make sure you're not fighting self-inflicted fires, whether it's security issues or all of those other things. And ideally that pie, which is what I can spend on product development and innovation and customer experience, et cetera, is as big as it possibly can. It's never gonna be enough. There's always more demand than supply, but I want that pie as big as it can be. To get that pie, big, we have to instill the mindset in IT that, you know, we, we need to get out of the way, right? Um, and right. You know, give people the tools and self-service because that allows us in IT to work on higher value added activities as well. What are the technologies that you're looking at for this year that seem to be rising in importance or prominence? RPA, AI, ML, all of these, I think, are really very important in, you know, chatbots, you know, and how do we look at automation in our processes and also in the customer experience. Um, 
you know, other things like 3D rendering and, you know, making things more real, you know, adding the dimension, um, adding dimensions into actually the workplace as well. I mean, some of the things that we've been looking at is, you know, how do we have, um, you know, casual collisions, you know, casual collisions we used to have in the office. So how do we create the same type of casual collision in an online world, you know, so maybe taking, you know, videos of some of our office space where this would occur and then creating drop-in rooms within, you know, within the video settings that we use for meetings and things like that. So um, I would say that, you know, technologies to help, you know, make things more real, um, to help with productivity, and, you know, to help with the experience is definitely uh, on my plate. I think all of those that that Cindy mentioned are spot on. I mean, I would throw in SD-WAN and a few other infrastructure kinds of things to to get away from some legacy technologies. But um, I think that the one thing you just have to guard against is doing it for technology's sake. Uh, I think Cindy made an excellent point earlier. What problem are we trying to solve here? And is something else going to go away? Are we enhancing it? Are we delighting our customers? Are we improving customer experience? Are we, you know, are we just putting a big piece of technical debt on top of the pile I already have. So uh, I, I just thinking, making sure you're thinking about it holistically, but I think all the, the technologies that Cindy mentioned are spot on. You both mentioned AI and machine learning. Where, where are we in terms of practical adoption of these technologies for, uh, for your organizations? And are we at the proof of concept stage? Are we actively adopting? Where are we with that? Adobe as a company, you know, we have our, you know, our AI special framework, we call it Sensei or the, you know, Adobe, you know, secret sauce of bringing things to life. But in the IT world, we're pretty far along. I mean, the self-healing framework that I talked about, healing as a service, uses, uh, uses AI and ML, I mean, in order to look at, you know, potential things that are happening in the infrastructure and do the self-healing component. We've also used it, you know, within... Um, I'll say our help desk, which is now pretty much virtual, it is virtual, uh, to look at, you know, problems people are having and then, you know, inject answers and things like that. So our experimentation, the proof of concept stage, Michael, I think started probably about um, maybe about 18 months ago, or maybe a little bit longer, you know, with little problems that we were trying to solve. And now we've expanded it out to, you know, using it in operations, using it to, and and help desk activities, using it to service employees and across the board. And it's um, it's been great because it's been um, a real career mover for some people, you know, that they've been able to really uh, change their skill set and, you know, move from one role into another role. And it's quite nice to see, actually. In my prior organization, we were, we were proof of concept with IoT and AI looking at we, I, I work for a, a very large manufacturer, and we were looking at what it could potentially do for giving us real-time analytics uh, throughout our operation 24-7, and then being able to predict things before they happened and find trouble spots uh, versus this reliance on pen and paper and just intuition and, hey, I've been here 25 years. That's great, and we always want to capture that and and leverage that. But but look, there's a whole bunch of tasks and, and data points coming in constantly um, I want our folks leading the organization and I want machine learning and AI looking at all of those different data points and helping us draw conclusions about problems that might be erupting before we can see them uh, so that we can either avoid them or at least somewhat mitigate them, whether it's a security incident, it's an equipment failure, uh, it's an operational challenge, it's a quality challenge, uh, it's a safety issue, all of those things. A question from uh, Elizabeth Shaw. How and where can IT help create value for both IT and the business? Is it data? And for what? Is it dealing with supply chain? Is it operational efficiency? It's kind of an all-encompassing question. It is really all of the above. Because if you think about everything that was outlined in that question, yeah. I mean, data for sure. Um, absolutely. And unlocking data and I like to talk about unlocking data and making it really insights where people can, you know, action and action in real time as opposed to looking back. And you can do that with customer journeys. Um, you mentioned supply chain. Um, I, I don't manage a supply chain now. We don't have one, but I have in the past. 
And that is such an area of opportunity. If you look at handoffs and quality and all kinds of things, and I'm sure, you know, Jay, you can talk about that because I'm sure you have a, a supply chain component in your in your new role. Um, operational improvements, for sure. That's that horizontal view and making sure that, you know, you look at it and help the business make those right decisions and, you know, help them with different trade-offs. I think all of those are big components. Michael, the one overarching umbrella that I would say is be easy to do business with internally and externally. Mm. You know, be open, be available. Don't be the old school IT department that's filled with a bunch of people that think they know better than everything. Uh, you know, just, I think the best way that you can be of value besides just executing and always pointing the finger inward about how you can get better is just be easy to do business with. And it goes back to that customer experience, be approachable, have open doors, be collaborative, uh, be open-minded when it comes to tech solutions, et cetera. So I think that's, it all starts with that, but you know, that's where I would start. We have a question from Arsalan Khan, and he's asking, which industries have you learned from outside of your own? So where have your sources of inspiration for being a CIO come from? One of the industries that you know I tend to follow or look at a lot is, um, well, there's two actually, retail and financial services. Um, because I think that when you think about some of the points that are really important to us, like experience. Those are both have, um, you know, a real, you know, deep uh, look at experience in different, in different ways, the customer and a holistic view. And then also, um, you know, if you think about financial services, it's just a discipline. And if you think about security and things around that, there's a lot that we can learn from that. I agree. I think retail is an excellent example, Cindy. And, and, and I continue to find inspiration whether it shows like yours, Michael, where you're bringing in all of these, you know, world lead, you know, these these world class CIOs and technologists and leaders, uh, or just networking with friends, Cindy. I mean, besides being a world class CIO, I mean, we've been friends for years, and, and you just you watch and you get inspired by things that they're doing. And why am I going to go recreate the wheel when somebody has solved a problem, or, or maybe just as, has been a reminder of things that I need to be focusing on because I get mired in the day to day and I see. Uh, I get inspired to maybe think about something differently. What's the hardest challenge that you faced during 2020? Quick takeaway is stay connected to people, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the technology, absolutely critically important, but it's the people and their feelings and, you know, what they need to do. Um, it's just that connection. That's, that's, how, um, that's how I got through it, right? Is that connection to people. Let me ask you both for your advice to CIOs who are seeing all the opportunities that you both described, but also seeing kind of the, the, the many challenges that CIOs face at this, at this moment. You know, it's a great time to be a CIO. I, I really do. I feel really, you know, and I know we're trying to be quick. I, I think right now our industry is more open-minded than ever. I think CIOs have uh, the biggest opportunity probably that they've had in, in years to, to be at the table and to be thought of as a leader first and a technologist second, because we're so ingrained with what organizations are doing. Challenges continue to be the uncertainty in the system. And obviously, um, COVID is still out there, but also security. It, it remains to be a challenge. And, and how can you continue to move fast with all of these different weird forces that are out there? My advice, you know, we talked about people, so I would say first, people first. But my other uh, piece of advice would be don't be afraid to break things, right? No. Challenge, challenge business models. There are no set business models today in COVID, right? Um, so we need to be agile and we need to challenge and we need to bring those ideas. And like I said, don't be afraid to break things. You may break things and discover something absolutely wonderful. Have either of you started using, or what do you think about emotional AI or effective AI? Just learning. How about that? Just just learning about it. Um, I, I think it's got a, a ton of potential, but um, at this point, uh, I mean, I'm in the nascent kind of uh, learning stage uh, about emotional AI. So, but I'm excited about its potential from what I read. I'm in the same camp. You know, a little experimentation, but it's just. Just that at this point. Okay. I think with that, 
our time together is drawing to a close. So I would like to express my thank you to Jay Farrow. He is the Chief Information Officer of ERT. And to Cynthia Stoddard. She is the Chief Information Officer of Adobe. Thank you both for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Michael. Great to see you. Everybody, thank you for watching, especially those folks who participated and asked questions. We have great shows coming up. Check out cxotalk.com. Before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so you can get our newsletter. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks to our guests. Have a great day.